Hi, I just got back from Switzerland. Uh, I have attended the International Team for Implantology, the ITI World Symposium in 2017, held in Basel, Switzerland. I've met some good old friends and we had so much fun. And also, I had a pleasure to give a small talk. And also, I had a very serious interview with the Geistlich newsletter. So, today I'm going to share the video clip of my small lecture. And I want to thank Professor Hyun Jung Lee for recording this video. Thank you very much. And I will be back with more interesting and informative videos. Thank you. Okay, good morning. My name is Jung Sol Park. I'm from South Korea. And my presentation will be the rich preservation with an open healing approach. Okay, um, four years ago, I had a great honor to receive the Andrea Schroeder Award on the studies that I performed the alveolar bone drive stromal stem cells. And in fact, I uh, prepared a very long speech for this award. Uh, unfortunately, no one asked me to give one, so I just took a picture and I had to come down the podium. So, like this. Okay, so on this occasion today, I want to thank ITI for giving me this great award, and I'm very, very honored to receive this award. Um, among various types of speeches, I think my speech will be very late, type 4 speeches, because it took me four years to give one. And we are all familiar with this kind of a classification because this is what we deal every day in our daily clinic. After expression, there are many treatment options, and one of them is gaining great popularity, which is the alveolar rich preservation or ARP. In the early studies of alveolar rich preservation, the flaps were mobilized and releasing incisions were placed to achieve the primary closure. Because we believe that primary closure was the number one rule to follow for a successful GBL and bone graft. However, there are a number of studies which investigated rich preservation with intentional secondary healing or without primary closure or some so-called open healing ARP. But at this moment, I want to suggest to differentiate these terms. Since open healing technique using resolvable membrane is completely different from open membrane technique using non-resolvable membrane. When we use the expanded PTFV membrane, once it's exposed, it's usually infected. And once it's exposed, you get six times less bone regeneration than the unexposed site. That's why the dense PTFV membrane with smaller pore size and minimal bacterial contamination was developed. And that's how we end up with the so-called open membrane technique for rich preservation and GBL that lots of clinicians love these days. Although there are several studies showing good results with the open membrane technique, but for periodontists, it's not a beautiful sight to watch during the healing period and no matter how long you wait, you will never see the spontaneous gingival closure of the membrane. On the contrary, if you use the resolvable membrane for open healing technique, initially it appears that it is resolved, but in fact it's rapidly vascularized and ultimately incorporated into host tissue. So if you use the resolvable membrane for open healing technique, you will get the preservation of the bony dimension, but also you're going to regenerate the firm and thick keratinized tissue as large as the extraction socket. And these authors also observed that there was significantly less shift of mucogingival junction in the open healing rich preservation group because there was no flap mobilization. And also patients reported less discomfort which is really, really important part. But still, you may ask, why do we have to uh, wait four to six months after rich preservation instead of we can wait four to six weeks and place implant with simultaneous GBL? The answer can be found in this book. 
When Alice reached the fork and she doesn't know where to go, she asks the cat where she has to go, and the cat asks where she wants to go. And Alice says, I don't know, I don't care. Then the cat gives the answer. If you don't know where you're going, it doesn't matter which path you take. In our daily clinic, if you don't know where you're going, it doesn't matter which procedure you choose. But if you know where you're going, it is so clear which procedure you should choose. So for me, the open healing rich preservation is the procedure to the ultimate simplicity to provide the sufficient bone and keratinized tissue for the patient with minimal effort and minimal chair time. So I wanted to uh, evaluate this open healing rich preservation can be used in more advanced clinical situations like posterior teeth and type 2 extraction socket with bone loss up to 50%. So in this randomized clinical trials, we divided the patients into three groups. In group one, after extraction, we grafted demineralized bovine bone mixed with collagen and covered with a non-cross-linked collagen membrane in two layers, and we had performed the X suture. Later, we found that this X suture is not an ideal suture for rich preservation, so we will discuss it later in this session. And after four months, the stealing was uneventful. In group two, after extraction, we grafted biomaterials without membrane coverage. After four months, the healing was uneventful, but you can see the slight collapse of the soft tissue. In group three, because it was a control group, we only did the suture. Using CBCT images, we have measured the horizontal and vertical dimensional changes before and after four months. And the radiographic analysis revealed that the group one, with the open healing rich preservation with the bone graft and the collagen membrane coverage, significantly prevented the horizontal and vertical dimensional changes. Meanwhile, the group two, the open healing rich preservation with only bone graft without membrane coverage, failed to do so. Along with this data, we have successfully placed the implants in all of our patients and we are following up them up to one year post-loading. So we hope to present the data in our future publications. During this clinical study, we had two insights, one about the force and one about the future. It is very interesting that because there is little study on the impact of the compression force on the biomaterials. So in 2015, the colleagues from Stony Brook University, they have investigated this issue. So using the two different uh, compression force in their rabbit calvarium model, they rated six weeks and they have evaluated using thermal image analysis and histomorphometric analysis. And in their analysis, it's quite interesting results because Unlike our common belief or common knowledge, the greater the compression forces, the greater newborn regeneration was observed. In their follow-up study published in 2016, they used canine extraction model, and in this, in this time, they used the they used the even greater compression force. So after eight weeks, the same and similar results were observed. Uh, using their histomorphometry and their uh, analysis, they have revealed that the greater compression forces, the greater bony <coughs> contour, and the more newborn regeneration was observed. So based on these two studies, we have performed and are small clinical trials. We have used the established open healing rich preservation study model, but this time the force was different. Uh, since we used the, the established open healing rich preservation model, it was clear to compare the impact of the compression force on the biomaterials. In our radiographic analysis, there was no statistical uh, difference, but from the histomorphometric analysis, we have demonstrated that the greater compression forces the greater <coughs> newborn regeneration was observed. And I'm going to show you the, the most representative histological slides. On the left side, in a passive and minimal compression force, you can see the particles, and there are some bone regeneration at four months. 
But if you look at the right side, uh, the particles are slightly more closely located. And if you look closely, it looks like the bone is jumping from particles to particles, and it's kind of climbing up the particles, just like when we see it from the contact osteogenesis. At this moment, we don't know why we're the ideal compression force, so definitely we need further studies on the uh, to elucidate this underlying mechanism. And finally, I want to briefly discuss about the suture technique for rich preservation. Uh, this is the cross matrix suture, or sometimes called the X suture, which is a very common suture after extraction or rich preservation. But after rich preservation, immediately after this X suture, you can see that there is a vector created in a buccal limbal dimension, and the mucogingival junction is shifted to the limbal side. And after four month healing, you're going to lose a lot of keratinized tissue due to this single suture, X suture. So we realize that we need to do something about this vector created in a buccal limbal dimension. So we change the suture. Instead of going buccal lingual and buccal lingual twice, we change the direction in oblique way from buccal to lingual and again from buccal to lingual. In this way, you can get rid of the buccal lingual contraction, rather you're going to have the measured distal contraction and the buccal side, the keratinized tissue, can stay safely. So this is called hidden X suture instead of the X suture. So we wanted to evaluate if this hidden X suture has clinical benefits instead of the X suture. So we have performed another clinical study. We have used again the established open healing rich preservation technique. Instead, the suture was different. But when we measured the keratinized tissue width, uh, the hidden X suture has shown that the hidden X suture can actually significantly preserve the width of the keratinized tissue in comparison to the X suture. But more interestingly, the hidden X suture has significantly better preserved the horizontal and vertical bony dimension. We don't know why, but we assume that maybe this cross sits inside the extraction socket and immediately above the membrane may have provided better stabilization of the biomaterials and it led to better bony regeneration. This one also needs further studies. Okay, I'm back to the, the question again. Where do we want to go? For me, I want to go to the procedure as simple as possible and I want to provide sufficient bone and sufficient characteristic tissue for my patients because at the end of the day, these are the key factors for long-term success. Okay, thank you for your kind attention. <laughs>